Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. So it's official. The European Space Agency is going to have their own presence in low Earth orbit and a human-rated space program to go with it. What can possibly make this dramatic change in philosophy happen? Can Europe really get on the ball when it comes to human-rated spaceflight after decades of letting NASA handle everything? All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon, and once again, welcome to The Angry Astronaut. So I am here in Greenville, South Carolina. Once again, I'm staying at a friend's house. Going to be seeing my son perform at a jazz ensemble tomorrow night. And then immediately thereafter, I am going to be heading to Boca Chica in the hope that a launch on the 17th on Friday doesn't actually transpire, given the current circumstances and the fact that as of this recording, Recording Starship is still unstacked, and the official FAA license has still yet to be issued. I have a feeling that Starship is not going to be able to fly on the first attempt. That is, of course, my personal hope. I certainly hope for everybody else's benefit who went to see this thing that it goes off on schedule and you all get to really enjoy that. However, if you'd like to support my efforts in getting to Boca Chica, um, all of the details are in the description. Could definitely use your help. So let's move on to other topics. A few weeks ago, I reported that Europe was likely to have their own space station soon because Airbus had taken over an extremely important component of the Starlab space station, a station that received NASA's blessings and also some financial support in order to find a private replacement for the International Space Station. However, there have been a number of partners who have been dropping out of this process recently. Most significantly has been the kind of uncertain nature of the collaboration between Sierra Space and Blue Origin. Although Blue Origin says that they are still committed to NASA's space station program, they didn't really mention the collaboration with Sierra Space, at least not in terms of the orbital reef station in particular, although Sierra Space says that they're committed to it, but all of that took quite some time to develop, and in the aftermath of a number of private sources saying that the two companies weren't going to be working together at all. So all this means is, is that new opportunities are opening up for other private space stations that may look upon themselves as the replacement or the heir apparent to the ISS. And the most significant of these, in my opinion, is Starlab. And the reason I feel that way is is because Europe has decided to take a very aggressive part in making sure that Starlab becomes a reality. Not only has Airbus become the largest partner in this collaboration to build this space station, but now the European Space Agency has decided that they're going to get 100% behind this station as well and to make sure that it's completely available for their astronauts. Now, of course, how can this even happen? ESA doesn't even have their own capability of delivering astronauts into orbit unless they do it through SpaceX or something along those lines. Well, it's because ESA has lots of plans for the future that involves them developing their own human-rated spaceflight capability. And Starlab is just one part of that overall plan. And let me tell you something, it's a big change in ESA's philosophy from decades and decades of just letting NASA handle everything. They're not gonna let that happen anymore. So a lot of you have seen some of this information before, but what I'd like to do is put it all together to demonstrate to you how the Europeans and ESA are putting together a fully-fledged human-rated space program in low Earth orbit that doesn't involve NASA in any really significant regard. The Airbus Loop is probably the most impressive component of this overall plan, an 8-meter space station module. 
absolutely enormous and not inflatable unlike the Sierra Space Modules, which means something 8 meters in diameter would definitely require Starship in order to be deployed, so in that regard, the Europeans are going to have to rely on American space agencies, but really not to any significant effect once this thing gets deployed. Well, why is that the case? Well, first of all, let's have a look at the loop again, just to give you an idea of how impressive this module is. It has three decks, one dedicated to habitation, one deck dedicated to scientific and manufacturing work, and a third deck dedicated to crew health, essentially. It rotates, generating a small amount of artificial gravity for the astronauts to work out in. A very unique approach to living in low Earth orbit, offering both microgravity and artificial gravity environments. Now, to be clear, this is a private space station. It does not belong to ESA or any government. Voyager space is officially the controlling interest, although there's certainly not the largest interest involved in the construction of this space station. However, they, NanoRacks, Northrop Grumman, and Airbus and the European Space Agency are all collaborating to build this thing. It consists of an extremely large habitation module, as I mentioned before, along with a power and propulsion element and a large solar array. It's designed to be deployed in a single launch of Starship, so the whole damn thing can be deployed in a single launch, which sets it apart from many other space station designs that NASA has been looking at to replace place the ISS. On top of that, it has lots of interesting features that are unique to the companies that are participating. Most significant of these is external payload hosting offered by NanoRacks. As you can see right here, it's a module that attaches to an airlock, and inside that module you have satellites and other payloads that can be deployed into low Earth orbit from a space station. This is not CGI. This is something that exists right now on the International Space Station at this moment. If you wanted to send a payload up to low Earth orbit and you didn't want to have to use a rocket that might or might not blow up, instead what you do is you send your payload up to the ISS as part of a cargo mission that might be on a SpaceX Dragon, for example, and it makes it a lot safer and a lot easier to deploy your payload if you have the crew of a space station at your disposal to help out. So it's a very interesting way of deploying low Earth orbit payloads and something that's unique to NanoRacks and to the Starlab space station. And as I say, not only can you deploy satellites and other payloads to low Earth orbit, you can also use this external hosting service to put an experiment, for example, into place without having to put it actually on the space station. Instead, it can be hosted externally, and then once your experiment is done, they can use the Canadarm to detach the payload, put it back on the SpaceX Dragon or some other space vehicle, and return it to Earth. By the way, these payloads are deployed by an airlock called Bishop that has its own power source, its own high-speed internet connection to the ground so you can communicate directly with your payload, all sorts of nice features included with all of this to make your deployment to low Earth orbit a lot more robust and also a lot less likely to fail. It's a neat system and one that Nanorax obviously intends to transfer over to the Starlab space station when it goes to orbit. But what's significant about this space station as far as ESA is concerned can be found in a Memorandum of Understanding or MOU that was recently signed between ESA and Voyager and all of the Starlab partners. This allows ESA the following, quote, access to the Starlab space station for ESA 
ESA and its member states for astronaut missions and research activities as well as commercial business development. Also contributions to research projects on upcoming missions using European technology and advancing European science from advanced robotics and artificial intelligence to life sciences and more. And finally, the establishment of a complete end-to-end -end system with the Starlab space station as a low Earth orbit destination and a potential ESA-developed European cargo and crew transportation system. Let me say that again. A potential ESA-developed European cargo and crew transportation system, meaning that ESA intends to transport both cargo and their own astronauts to Starlab on their own. So how is all of this going to be possible? Well, first let's talk about the cargo piece. This is the Argo from Jason and the Argonauts fame, and it's something you guys may be familiar with because I've talked about it before. Rocket Factory Augsburg is in the process of manufacturing their own resupply ship for a future European space station. It's capable, as you can see, of carrying 3.4 metric tons up to low Earth orbit. It has 13 cubic meters worth of pressurized space, and most importantly, it's 100 percent reusable with an inflatable heat shield. Now RFA is making sure that their ship is launch provider agnostic so this thing could go up on an Ariane 6 or perhaps even a Falcon 9 as well. However, they're also building their own heavier lift rocket, obviously with a lot more payload capability than their RFA-1 has in order to carry this thing as well. This is a company that's definitely wading into the big boy realm of space launch capabilities and it's very exciting to see what's going to happen next. But RFA is not the only company looking to provide resupply to this new space station. In addition, you also have the Exploration Company and their Nick Space Capsule, which I think all of you should be familiar with at this point, given how many times I've reported on it. This is a capsule that again is fully reusable, has its own power supply of course, but more excitingly is capable of lunar missions as well as missions to low Earth orbit. As a matter of fact, the exploration company really has the moon as a final target for this spacecraft much more than low Earth orbit. In addition to that, it's capable of hopping across the moon to multiple locations on a single mission and also eventually it's going to be human rated. So right here we have a space station, we have commercial resupply for that space station, and we have a space capsule that will eventually be human rated. But ESA is not going to wait for the exploration company to get to this point. Instead, just recently at a meeting in Seville, the ESA member states decided to double down on Ariane 6, which on the surface may seem like an incredibly stupid thing to do, given the fact that Ariane 6 is expendable, outdated, and wasteful. But the reason I think it's a good idea to invest 350 million euros a year in Ariane 6, which is the amount that the member nations eventually came to, is because Ariane Spas is embracing innovation and reusability in a big way, in a way they never have before. The new Prometheus engine is 100% reusable. The new booster for the Ariane 6 in the future is also going to be reusable, but the development that I find to be the most exciting is the reusable liquid boosters that Ariane Spas intends to integrate in with the Ariane 6 instead of solid rocket boosters. These are going to have a cluster of three Prometheus engines apiece, and given the fact that theoretically you could put four of these suckers onto an Ariane 6, that gives it a total thrust of over three and a half million pounds, or nearly 
nearly double the thrust capability of a Falcon 9. Not quite a Falcon Heavy, but still a heavy lift rocket. And on top of all of that, you have something called the Icarus, which is a new type of upper stage with carbon fiber to make it a lot lighter, therefore making it easier to deploy heavier payloads, liquid reusable boosters, as I said before, but the most exciting thing of all is the Suzy, the smart upper stage for innovative exploration. In other words, a reusable upper stage and human rated. An Ariane 6 with reusable Prometheus engines and reusable boosters and a reusable second stage is essentially a mini starship, a fully reusable transportation system. And that is a massive step forward for a company like Ariane Spas. Now, the Suzy obviously is still in early stages of development. Who knows when the hell it's finally going to be in service, but the fact of the matter is is Ariane Spas, after spending many years dragging way behind SpaceX and their other American competitors, are finally wading into an area of innovative technology that will make them far more competitive in the future. Now, Suzy is nowhere near as big as Starship, but has triple the habitable space that a Crew Dragon has, so capable of carrying at least five crew members, and honestly, probably several more than that given how much habitable space it actually has and it's capable of carrying a substantial amount of cargo in the same mission and of course since it lands like starship it doesn't require parachutes or an oceanic recovery or even a landing strip it can simply come back down with a propulsive landing probably landing close to where it took off from in the first place amazing capabilities for this spacecraft depending of course on when Ariane's boss can get it into service but still this is a colossal transformation in ESA's philosophy. For the longest time, ESA was not interested in human spaceflight. They were content in training a few astronauts, sending them up on NASA missions, on SpaceX missions, etc., and not handling any of it themselves. Now in the future, European children can look forward to a much greater possibility of going to space as a representative representative of their own nation and this should be an exciting thing to all Europeans and really exciting to every type of space flight enthusiast because it means that everyone is getting involved in human space flight not just the Americans not just the Russians not just the Chinese but everyone and with this new agreement between ESA and Voyager the Europeans have a clear path and a comprehensive path to a human-rated space program without NASA or anybody else. Thanks so much Jeff Dunn, Daniel Tao, Ted Thayer, and Wayne Smith for becoming my latest Patreon supporters. Really appreciate your help and welcome to the growing Angry Astronaut family. If you'd like to join them, all the details are in the description, but please like, Please subscribe. Thank you very much for watching, and as always, stay angry about space.